Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Justina. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, and this uh, discussion, I guess, stems from something that I learned uh, at a chemistry conference. So the annual chemistry conference is held in end of May, June every year. And at, uh, I think, three years ago or just before COVID, they held a conference in Quebec City where one of the features was science arts. So bringing arts into STEM. So the joke said, well, let's turn STEM into STEAM. So science, technology, uh, um, uh, engineering, uh, art, and mathematics. So really bring all of those disciplines together. And part of the issue of being scientists is we need to be able to communicate to a general audience. Uh, let's see, I've got my one of my hairs on me. <laughs> um, right, so we need to be able to communicate to the public because ultimately, especially with research that we're doing in universities, we're being funded by taxpayer money. So therefore, we do have a responsibility to be able to communicate to the public uh, in a way that helps them understand what it is that we do. And as a chemist in particular, it's it's a bit of an uphill battle because people have this misconception or this, this prejudice against chemistry that chemistry is this toxic thing that generates pollution in the environment. And oh, no one wants to live next to a chemical plant because they're dirty things. And, and oh, we want to live a chemical free life. Well, you cannot live a chemical free life because we as you know, living things, we are bags of chemicals, right? I mean, this is it, we, we contain chemicals. Um, I saw a really frustrating to me post on Facebook, sort of comparing it was uh, essentially it had a beef burger sitting next to a meat-free burger that's becoming very popular nowadays. And it listed all the ingredients of the meat-free burger, uh, including the various, you know, preservatives that might be in there, the different proteins that are added, etc. cetera, uh, uh, beet extracts to give it the red color. And then next to it, it's oh, beef burger contains beef. And I'm like, well, that's not true at all because beef is not beef. Beef contains fats and amino acids and proteins and salts, right? So there, there are lots of things that can be broken down into it. So we as scientists need to be able to communicate that to the general public and try to address this um, misconception and pseudoscientific uh, anti-science that's going. So one way of doing that is through art. So a lot of students come in to university with, um, they might want to follow a career in science or engineering, but many of them are, are artists themselves. They're either visual artists, they're musicians, they love to read, they love to write, they like to write songs, tell stories. So why not bring that part of everybody's life, every student's life, into their learning to get them more interested in studying? Chemistry is also, in my particular case, a, a course that a lot of students take because they they have to take it. So although a minority of my students might have chosen to do a chemistry uh, degree or to do a chemistry course because they're passionate and they're interested in chemistry, the vast majority are doing it because they see the end goal, oh, I want to go into medicine, medicine requires me to have a chemistry background, or I want to be a pharmacist, to be a pharmacist I'm required to do chemistry. Even kinesiology and engineering requires some degree of, of chemistry background. So a lot of these students are taking it not because they really want to, but because they have to. So my role as a first year instructor, I see it as getting the students interested in science for science sake, for the, just for the benefit of knowledge, for learning and appreciating what chemistry can do. At the same time, if I can incorporate some of their hobbies, the other things that they enjoy doing into learning chemistry, then the chore of learning chemistry becomes less of a chore, it becomes more pleasant that they can see that this overlap, that they can communicate uh, using these different formats, these different media. So what I've done is I've created a set of assignments as part of my assessment uh, program for first year chemistry to include chem art. Uh, and there are lots of examples. So if I can share my screen here, I'll show you here we are. So this is my PowerPoint. Hopefully you can all see that. 
So if I maximize that, there we go. So this is a PowerPoint that summarizes the assignments that I provided to students as an option. So creative chemistry assignments for Chem 1050, part of your course will come from completing one of these assignments. And most of you will complete these on your own, but some of them allow, uh, some of the assignments allow the students to work in small groups, uh, which allows for more diverse creativity as well. And I do give them very specific instructions as to the assessment criteria. And I do give them a long submission deadline. Some students have already submitted their assignment for this semester. Others will wait until the last minute, but it is fun to start seeing them come in. And then what I do with the creative assignments, especially the art-based ones, I create a gallery in Brightspace and I allow, allow the other students in the class to go through the gallery and vote on their favorite piece of chem art. And then the chem art with the most votes gets a prize at the end of the semester. So there's there are grades that are awarded for it, but also just for fun. Um, so here are the five assignments. So one of them is to make a TikTok video. So TikTok seems to be uh, a, a very popular social media site for students to make, for people to make short videos. Uh, and it's becoming an increasingly more important medium for science communication, as well as for news communication. Unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation as with all media, but it does allow uh, people to provide a lot of um, uh, communication with the outside world. Certainly uh, with the, the situation in Ukraine right now, I do follow quite a lot of TikTokers who provide updates on what's happening in Kyiv and Lviv. I, I still have family that live in that part of the world. Um, so it's interesting to, to get that perspective from people. So, But students use it for entertainment for the most part. Uh, but there is an opportunity to use it to communicate science. And there are lots of science TikTokers out there. Uh, the next assignment is creating an infographic about chemistry in everyday life. So an infographic is essentially, it's a one page document that is at least 50% visual, no more than 50% text that explains potentially complex uh, ideas in science to a general audience. And this is uh, uh, almost the equivalent to a three second soundbite uh, in uh, other media. You can use infographics to communicate a lot of ideas in a very short amount of time. Uh, I know recently there was a presentation by Dr. Erica Mercer on the chemistry department about using infographic based uh, syllabus or course uh, outlines. And I've incorporated a little bit of that as well. I've been using infographic based cor cor uh, course outlines for a few years now. Uh, so I thought I'd turn it into an assignment as well. Uh, third, they have an option to write or record a song that relates to chemistry. And in Newfoundland, everyone seems to be a musician here. So this was a surprisingly popular option that students uh, took up and it was a lot of fun. Uh, for students who are more interested in writing as opposed to visual or musical uh, uh, um, communication or art forms, uh, a one page public interest story. So quite a few of our students in chemistry end up finding the journalism side uh, of communicating science much more up their street as opposed to doing research and lab-based studies or even teaching. So this allows those students an opportunity to practice their, uh, their writing skills. And then lastly, there's chem art. So this one is completely up to the students. Most students do a visual art, something uh, graphic, um, very, very creative. And I'll provide some examples of what students have done. And these assignments provide 5% towards their final grade. During COVID lockdown, I increased this up to 20% and I provided students with the option of you know, I gave them seven options of which they could choose four to do. So there was a lot more uh, opportunity for them to do these. But now that we've returned to in-person teaching, there are other demands on students' time with laboratories being uh, in-person again. So I've, I've reduced it down to one because I do want them to provide quite a bit of effort behind uh, each of these projects. Uh, and I do provide assessment criteria for each assignment carefully. So my number one criteria is regardless what they do, the chemistry must be correct. They cannot make stuff up. They cannot make up molecules. It has to be scientifically accurate and that carries the majority of the weight. And of course, academic dishonesty and plagiarism copying wasn't tolerated. So do not pass off someone else's work as their own. So if I go down here, so I created an infographic uh, of how to make infographics, including TikTok. So here's the assignment. Let me just move my little screen out of the way here. So for the assignment, I asked them to 
uh, work with up to two people. So if someone can record the video, the other two students can perform in front of the camera. Uh, the forum is to create a short video, like on TikTok. It doesn't have to be a TikTok video, but any sort of video style, uh, short bite uh, of, uh, of content. Uh, the grading, 5%. Again, the chemistry must be accurate and informative, must be at least 30 seconds long. No offensive content is permitted. I give them a firm due date. They say the perks, the top five to 10 students, I invite them for a coffee and cake chat and we get to talk about science or uh, career guidance, right? So it's an opportunity for me as the course instructor to get to know the students a little bit better because I'm teaching 150 students at a time. So it's very difficult to develop a, a good rapport with individuals when you've got that ratio of students to instructors. So I provide a nice little summary here. They can work with up to two friends, submit it as an MP4. I'll create a gallery. And in terms of assessment criteria, which is available off the bottom, 60% is uh, for uh, the accuracy of the chemistry and the uniqueness. And then the remaining 40% comes from the three Cs, which I call creativity, complexity, and quality. <laughs> so it has to be good quality. It has to be sufficiently complex. Uh, you can't provide a video that says, oh, ice is, uh, water is made up of H2O. Done. <laughs> it has to be a little bit more complex than that. And it has to be creative. It definitely has to demonstrate creativity. So another uh, option that I provide them is the infographic. And here's one on the chemistry of mangoes. So this website, uh, Compound Chem, they're on Facebook, is wonderful because they provide hundreds and hundreds of different infographics. Uh, for example, when the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, was uh, announced uh, last week, um, they provided a wonderful infographic explaining the complexity of click chemistry, which is what won the Nobel Prize, and its relationship to uh, medical research, and not just synthetic chemistry. Uh, so as you see here, the, the infographic is, you know, 50% uh, visual uh, and then a small amount of text to explain it. The chemistry content is kept uh, relatively minimal so that someone who isn't an expert can at least appreciate the structural variation. They may not know exactly what is going on, but it does try to not dumb it down so much that it removes the actual chemistry content from it. So again, here, the task was create an infographic upload it to Brightspace, I grade it based on use of color, creativity, chemical accuracy, and again, suitability for the public. So essentially, if these are first year students, I say you are teaching other students at your level, right? So you are teaching other first year students, that is your target audience. And, and students then take this on board and create these wonderful infographics. Uh, the next assignment is to record a song, same thing. They can record a short song or they can sample a song, remix a song. Um, and again, 60% uh, comes from the accuracy of the chemistry of the chosen topic and 40% comes from the, the, the quality of the presentation. Uh, the fourth option is to create the public interest story that I mentioned about. So this is a 1000 word story about a chemistry topic. So something that would appear, for example, in a popular science journal um, that you think the public should know about. Again, the target audience is the general public. So don't re don't write it like a scientific paper for other chemists. Treat it to someone who has a small degree of uh, a chemistry background, who has some uh, um, chemical, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, basically is, is literate, I guess, in the chemistry uh, to a basic level. We'll have done high school chemistry or first year chemistry. And uh, again, uh, I make sure that grammatically it is correct, but also the science, the chemistry is accurate um, and the, the quality of the presentation is done and visuals, figures, et cetera, uh, are, are encouraged. And I provide them with some excellent examples from the Science Blogs uh, website. For in this case, it was what is an electron. And then lastly, ChemArt is completely open to the audience. Uh, whatever the students want to do, uh, they can usually uh, choose a medium which is visual art. So they'll paint or they'll draw something uh, or they'll do something else like an interpretive dance. I had a student submit that, which was very interesting. Um, or some students really like making TikTok videos. So they prepared another uh, a form of something a little bit more elaborate to a TikTok video, uh, like a small play. So there are lots of opportunities here.
Um, so that concludes that. And now I'll just provide a few examples, if I could. Let me stop sharing that. And instead, let me share my screen. Yeah, I'll share my whole screen here. And now I've got my, my short list here. So for example, uh, I'll go through some visuals. So this student for their chem art, uh, she really liked baking. So she made cake pops and colored them the appropriate color coding of the, the atoms, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, and made molecules such as caffeine, ethanol, acetic acid, water, urea. And these are structurally correct and, and very creative. So she did quite well. Uh, the next assignment I'll show is, oh yes, Emily Bautista made a comic strip of Molar Man and uh, Gina Noble. Gina Noble, like a noble gas, doesn't react to anything. So there's a little bit of science in here. Uh, visually, this was great. I would have liked to have seen more chemistry in this, but it definitely shows the level of talent and artistry that a lot of students have. So uh, this student, uh, I've lost touch with what uh, Emily is doing, but uh, uh, she definitely enjoyed uh, working on this project. And I shared it with a friend of mine who's a comic illustrator in Toronto, and he thought it was fantastic. So if a fellow comic animator thought it was great. Um, Madison, what she did was she painted a, a periodic table of rocks. And on each of the rocks, she tried to include an illustration of what that uh, element is most commonly found in. So, for example, boron is used in glue, aluminum is used in making metal, silicon is used in making uh, cements. So, she's got some brickworks here. Phosphorus is a very important bioelement. So, uh, she's got some DNA in here, which contains uh, a phosphate backbone uh, in. For iron, she has a bridge being drawn. Uh, yttrium is found in uh, old television screens. So she really did a lot of work here. So for France or Francium, she has the French flag here. I'm trying to find polonium to see if she uh, managed to... There's lead, fluorovium. Where's polonium? There's... Oh, see. Yep, there's polonium here. I can't see what she's drawn there for polonium. So polonium was discovered by Mary Curie and named after Poland. So uh, helium has got a little balloon next to it. Uh, so she's done a lot of work. Calcium's got a skeleton for bones. So she's definitely done a lot of research and learned what each of the elements is most commonly found in. So this required quite a bit of effort. Um, ah, in this case, this student did a family portrait of the noble gases which is kind of cool. Uh, helium is meant to be where it's the lightest element. It's the light princess. She's very bright. Helium's found in the sun. Neon, the very dandy uh, duke. Uh, the colors correspond to the light spectrum given off by the elements. Uh, argon, argon means the sleepy one or the lazy one. So here the duchess is yawning. She's, you know, wants to go to sleep, very lazy. Krypton is the count. So Krypton is uh, the hidden one. So Krypton, he's hiding behind his uh, cloak. Uh, Xenon, the stranger. So Xenon comes from Xenos in Greek, meaning the stranger, uh, dressed as a, a plague doctor, which especially was this was drawn during COVID, was quite appropriate. And then Radon, where it's a radioactive uh, a noble gas, it undergoes a nuclear transformation. It's the alchemist, so it undergoes transmutation. So the student definitely did some research uh, into the noble gases. Uh, and I'll show you a little video now as well. This is one of my favorites that was done uh, by one of uh, my students. And hopefully you can hear the audio with this. Let me know if you can't. So here she's explaining a little cat is having a greasy cheeseburger. Its paws are coated with oil. It then goes to try to, sorry, wash its hands. It can't because the grease and the water are immiscible. The water isn't effective, but adds a little soap to its paws. It does the trick. Now it asks the questions, why? Why does soap allow me to take the grease off my paws? Because water molecules are polar. 
And then the cat learns that oil and grease molecules are nonpolar. So therefore, because of their different uh, polarities, they're not admissible. But soap solves that problem because soap has a special structure that allows both polar and nonpolar substances to mix because it has a nonpolar tail and a polar head. Uh, so therefore, it allows for uh, greasy molecules to now become water soluble. And then, yep, yeah, talks about the polar head, et cetera. So that was a cute little video that was done. Uh, and there, there are many, many more. So I had 150 students that year with lots and lots of submissions. So it was really outstanding. So I'll stop sharing there. And uh, yeah, so it was a really good way of, especially during uh, the COVID lockdown, uh, keep students interested. They learned a little bit of chemistry that might have been outside the scope of the course, but allowed them to do their own digging. They taught themselves. So it was self-directed learning, uh, involved a little bit of creativity. It got them excited about learning some chemistry and uh, communicate their learnings as well. So yes, I'm very happy to discuss uh, ideas for the future, any ways that you think you might be able to incorporate uh, uh, visual or artistry into your evaluations and your courses. And yeah, look forward to hearing your feedback. I can, okay, sorry, I'll, I'll let Pavan start. <laughs> yes, Pavan, please. Oh, hi, Chris. Uh, it's really interesting. I mean, the way our students have done. Uh, I recall they're all uh, first year students. And yes, you? that's right. Okay. So, uh, so to speak, you just gave me an idea uh, to implement in my third year course, which mm -hmm. is a basic molecular biology. Like, we, uh, I mean, the students basically come up with a hypothesis to test in the laboratory. Now, right. what I'm thinking is uh, uh, maybe I could ask them to uh, have a graphical abstract. Yes, absolutely. What you study is something like that. Yeah. No graphical abstracts, and this is what I find even with my graduate students when we write papers. Most mm -hmm. journals now request a really elaborate graphical abstract, and that's often the thing that the graduate students, the PhD and master's students, leave until the last minute. They often yeah. forget that it's something that has to be submitted, and then they sort of put something together that's not particularly inspiring. And as I tell students, if you're reading through a table of abstracts. It's the visuals that attract you. If you're scrolling down a list of, of papers in the table of contents, you want a really eye-catching table of contents graphic. And this is something Juliana's here. This is something that Juliana is absolutely gifted at. She uh, was one of our best, most prolific uh, visual table of contents graphics <laughs> creators in our group. So I'm really glad Ju is here. Um, but yeah, doing something I think like that is fantastic. Uh, especially where biochemistry, I remember learning biochemistry myself and molecular biology, so much of that is through really artistic illustrations of what the cross section of the cell looks like. So what happens when a ribosome is functioning? So how do enzymes actually work with their lock and key mechanisms? These are all very visual ways that we communicate things that are not visible to the naked eye. So it involves a lot of artistry, but also the science has to be correct. So I think in biochemistry, it would be very easy and important for you to have your students learn to communicate that way. Yeah, actually, um, uh, before this, uh, I mean, uh, this fall, I'm also teaching a course at the fourth year level. So I thought maybe being fourth year and honor students, they do work in a research environment. They could come up with a graphical abstract, but then uh, I thought maybe not all of them already been exposed to this kind of work, uh, creating uh, uh, models on a PowerPoint or using a, a bio render or something. Now, yeah, actually, I think I'm going to implement this one starting next year. No, it's it's a good I can, idea. I can give them uh, bonus points if they could come up with something. I mean, not necessarily part of the assessment. Mm -hmm. If uh, bonus points allowed, I need to check with the other colleagues. Anyway, yeah, I just wanted to uh, you know comment. And thank you. No, I think it's it's absolutely brilliant. And I mean, we uh, science. If we think about PowerPoint presentations when we go to conferences and and give talks, uh, 
we have sometimes I've seen really excellent talks presented by scientists who present very little effort into their PowerPoint slides. And, and despite the fact that the science is great and their publications are world beating, their ability to communicate that and inspire someone who isn't an expert is a little bit lacking. Uh, whereas then I'll often see uh, young scientists coming up and they will provide so much effort to communicating their science uh, in a clear way because they don't have that name and brand recognition that mm -hmm. a senior researcher will. So they want to be eye-catching. They're the ones that are looking for students to join their group. They're the ones who want to be seen as excellent communicators. So it's it's definitely a skill set that we really need to instill in our students. So communicating clearly via PowerPoint, uh, have them practice their presentation skills is great. And what's a PowerPoint if not a collection of infographics, really? Each PowerPoint slide is an infographic where you're communicating one, two, three ideas with some visuals to support it. And you're trying to get a point across in as simple a way as possible. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, <laughs> this is something uh, I'm even struggling to, uh, you know, communicate with my grad students. So yeah, hopefully. Uh, anyway. Uh, thank you very much uh, You're for sharing uh, your experience with us.